Now, one of the issues that I've been interested in is what are the mechanisms? We're getting into that right now in the next slide as to what, in fact, is doing this. We talked about, you know, more episodes, greater illness, severity. We talked about duration of illness. But there's other factors we're going to say a few words about. And again, I'm really interested in what are the modifiable factors. And one of the modifiable factors we're going to talk about is uh, psychosis. Psychosis is anticognitive. So clearly attenuating psychosis, of course, would be, we all know it's what we want to do. But in addition to alleviating patient distress, it also reduces the burden cognitively, if you will. The other point I wanted to underscore is obesity and medical conditions, which I'll come back to in just a moment. For now, just to keep this pithy, what I would say is, is that with respect to genetics, we have no question that genetics plays a role. I, at this point, could not say that we have a compelling story yet around any select gene allele or collection of alleles that is considered to be the pro-cognitive gene or the anti-cognitive genes or genes. But we can agree that bipolar disorder is highly genetic and highly epigenetic, that is, it's influenced by environment. And we can agree this plays some role. But let me just bring this, if I could, I'm going to cascade up. Cascade up meaning going from the gene up to the circuit. And we know that in the human brain of healthy controls and as well as in people with bipolar disorder, there are brain circuits and networks that are well characterized that are known to subserve those functions of cognition that we defined in our glossary earlier. And it's not without our interest that those circuits and networks that are known to subserve cognition are abnormal in their structure, they're abnormal in their functional integrity. And they're also abnormal in their chemical composition in people who have bipolar. And that may be the biological explanation for why our patients in our offices are complaining of this problem. Now, other factors that play a role are child adversity. We've just recently reported on an anti-inflammatory drug in bipolar disorder. And in that study, we had observed what others had observed, that about half of people with bipolar have childhood sexual and physical abuse. And that's known also to interfere with cognition. The other part about a highlight is sleep disruption. Nobody's unaware of how problematic circadian rhythms are in people with bipolar disorder. In fact, the case could almost be made that bipolar is primarily a circadian disorder. And we know that circadian disturbance, as evidenced by disruption in sleep, can in fact also affect cognition. So when I'm helping my patients with sleep behavior and sleep efficiency, in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking about how can this benefit my patient's cognition? So when we get into some of the other factors about, you know, cognition and, and what's heritable, I wanted to underscore that if we were to take first degree family members of an adult that we see who has bipolar disorder, so these are unaffected first degree relatives of a patient or what's called a proband who has bipolar, and we were to ask that unaffected first degree relative, a sister, a brother, a mom, a dad, to sit down with the psychometrist and go through a cognitive test, the psychometrist would come back to our office and say, you know what, that person who doesn't have bipolar also exhibits cognitive problems relative to healthy controls. Now, that's a, a longer story, what that means and so on, but it, it's a very powerful illustration that cognitive deficits in bipolar are actually heritable and are likely present in many people even before they declare mania or depression. And this has been well established. And this is why we often state that bipolar is not just a degenerative disease of the brain, it's also a developmental alteration of the brain. So I was uh, forecasting a moment ago in terms of both adversity. Uh, adversity is known, in fact, to reduce measures of cognitive performance. And I should underscore both objective and subjective. I keep separating those two out because we know that objective and subjective cognitive functions don't correlate very highly, and both are adversely affected in people who do report adversity. It's a testable hypothesis that the mediator of this is through abnormalities in the stress response system, maybe inflammation, insulin resistance, all of which are replicated physiologic alterations in people exposed to trauma. Now, with respect to the circuits, we made uh, reference to this a moment ago. Uh, this is not really a secret. This has been one of the exciting areas of neuroscience, 
the ability with non-invasive imaging, as well as, of course, post-mortem, uh, brain studies, and now some very interesting computer models that have been proffered that allow us to framework, if you will, the underlying substrates that subserve cognition. Said differently, we know exactly the architecture in the brain, the scaffolding in the brain, which are known as circuits and networks that are subserving cognitive functions. Now, historically, we've been very kind of focused on a region, like the prefrontal cortex. And we know the prefrontal cortex, for example, the lateral part of the cortex participates in aspects of executive function. That's been well known and well replicated. Other regions are involved in, for example, memory. Other regions are involved in, for example, uh, attention. But I think what's more interesting is an integrated model. In other words, it's not so much that a region is abnormal, but the functional interconnectivity between the regions is abnormal. And this probably is what contributes to decreased cognitive efficiency. So just like your motor in your old Chevy from the 1970s, that motor is not as efficient as it once was, the brain is not as efficient. And this has been proxied through a variety of imaging approaches. Not only is there alterations in the circuit anatomy, but the efficiency of the interconnectedness is altered and the, what we call the reciprocity of the circuits are abnormal. Now, when we talk about really uh, regions that you can see here on this slide, really the reminder that the circuits not only involve cortical, but also subcortical structures. Let me give you an illustration. A lot of patients we see with bipolar disorder, when you ask them, have you ever had a history of mania? And we already have medical records documenting they have mania. Many patients, in fact, say, nope, I've never been hospitalized before. And they just simply forget. Now, sometimes they don't forget. Sometimes they just don't want to mention it, but often they forget. In other cases, patients will say to us, you know, I've never been well my whole life. But it turns out that they were well two years ago. They just forgot. And what this is, is a problem with the subcortical cortical connectivity. In other words, the emotional center of the brain is not in the normal interplay with the, with the cortical part of the brain. And as a consequence, we have retrospective biases. We've got memory biases. We often have attentional biases in these patients. And we often have this this gravitational pull towards all things negative because of this alteration in the cortical subcortical network. I had mentioned earlier that medical comorbidity influences cognition. It certainly does. And everyone knows thyroid would play a role here. I wanted to also bring to your attention the anti-cognitive effects of obesity. And this was an analysis that colleagues of mine and I recently published looking at the influence of obesity on measures of cognition, notably executive function, processing speed, and overall cognition in adults who have bipolar disorder. And this is breaking it down further into dimensions of hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes. But to keep this digestible, and I appreciate it's a lunch hour here, I want you to remember that obesity interferes with cognition. Said differently, if we were to enroll 100 or 300 people who don't have mental illness but have obesity, they also would exhibit cognitive deficits as a consequence of the obesity, or perhaps the cognitive deficits in some cases may even predate their obesity. And we're learning now that through inflammation, through insulin resistance, maybe other pathways like stress response systems, like the autonomic system, there's an interference with cognition. Now, this is yet Another reason why we need to be thinking about managing patients below the neck, not just above the neck, insofar as we all agree cognition is relevant, if obesity is playing some contributory role, this speaks to the importance of uh, prevention and obviously of treating this problem when it exists. And parenthetically, I'll just mention that bariatric surgery in the general population has been shown to exhibit procognitive effects. So that's a further proof of the concept. Now, with respect to the dose response, this is the purpose of this slide, said differently, the more your BMI is, the more overweight obese you are, the more likely you're seeing cognitive impairment. And in the world of association versus causation, as we build the case that this is causative, not just associative, 
that this gives us reason to believe this is causative. And for those who are wondering, we think it's through a host of different mechanisms. And these mechanisms can be encompassed by this notion of metabaptosis. You see, all of our cells are programmed to die. And when they are dying at an age earlier than expected, that's called apoptosis. And when that premature cell death is occurring because of metabolic perturbation, we call that metabaptosis. And that's driven by insulin resistance. It's driven by inflammation and oxidative stress. So I like to refer to this notion that obesity does metastasize to the brain in our patients with bipolar, and it does it through one or more of these effectors that I just enumerated earlier. Clearly, it's an interesting hypothesis that if we were to engage our patients not just in weight loss, but also better sleep, better diet, perhaps even aerobic slash resistance exercise, heck, that might in fact be preservative and even enhancing cognition through one or more of these mechanisms. That's a testable hypothesis. Now, these are, in fact, a summary of different systems that are interconnected that we think are responsible for this profound cognitive and progressive impairment that is so pertinent to our patients with bipolar disorder. And we've been hearing about, as I said a moment ago, you know, what role would, for example, sleep, whether it's through cognitive behavioral therapy, insomnia, and or through a pharmacologic approach, could that be pro-cognitive? And that's a very coherent, testable hypothesis in our patients with bipolar. We all know we need to help our patients with sleep because we don't want to see them disrupt into mania or mood instability. In addition to that, could it also be pro-cognitive? To keep going with this notion, other neurochemical systems like GABA and glutamate, what role do they play? Lots of interest in GABA glutamate signaling in psychiatry, particularly in light of ketamine's recent approval in March, at least the uh, acid depression. Are there roles here for these, for these types of treatments? And again, this is not always through pharmacology. It could be through other interventions. Now, with respect to strategies for preserving and enhancing cognition, let's go through some of that if we can right now. So this, in fact, is really looking at the cognitive deterioration across time. And I think this makes the case strong around the, the topic of progression. Said differently, if we were to meet somebody in the early stages of bipolar disorder, say after their first episode, on average, they perform cognitively better than someone who's had three to five, certainly more than five episodes. And I think every clinician knows that. By the way, again, parenthetically, I've mentioned that every clinician knows that when a patient says to them, I've had more than five episodes versus someone who's had less than five episodes, the person who's had more frequent episodes is less likely to respond as consistently to medication therapy and bipolar. Now, that's not always the case. I'm not saying that they don't respond. I'm saying that they're just less responsive. And there's a working hypothesis in the business that, in part, the, the diminution in efficacy with drug therapy and bipolar in more episode-prone patients may in part be because you have a more profound disturbance in cognition, a more profound disturbance in the progression of the illness. As I said earlier in this presentation, if we were to see family members who are not affected, they also exhibit deficits in cognition. And there's been plenty of literature now to show that people who eventually declare themselves as having bipolar they also have cognitive deficits that predate mania and depression. And how would you know this? Well, they, we know this because in some parts of the world, people sign up for service with the government or military or, or sometimes as part of other activities. Um, for example, Scandinavia, people will do this as part of uh, some of the countries there as part of a kind of a social contribution. They'll answer questionnaires and cognitive tests. And that information has been used to retrospectively identify this observation that there's cognitive impairment predating bipolarity. So it's progressive. That's the message. 